Hmm. I'm dark right now. All right, we are on the air. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to Code Mentor Office Hours today. Uh, we have a really special session. I'm actually in person in uh, with Pascal da Silva in the Kesey office in Brooklyn, New York, which uh, maybe at some point we'll find a way to turn the camera around to the unbelievable view they have here. Um, but uh, we're really excited about today's session. Um, it's going to be uh, a design and animation focused session, which uh, is not what we've, we've done in a little while. So, um, you know, really what we want to do today is uh, I'm just going to give a little intro to Pascal, and then he's going to kick it off with walking us through a number of his projects, and then we'll hit Q&A. So along this whole session, please feel free to use the, the chat app or the Q&A app, whatever works for you, and uh, we'll, we'll get to questions the second half. But um, embarrassingly, uh, Pascal will see me just reading the bio next to him. Normally, I'm I'm standing up. <laughs> um, but uh, Pascal Silva is the creative director and co-founder of Kizi, which is a member of a larger startup uh, called Elepath. If you're not familiar with Kizi, it's a, a ridiculously addictive music making app for yeah. iOS. Um, as a designer, Pascal's worked on projects for Tumblr, Jawbone, Adobe, Apple, Boxy, Samsung, and many more very big names. Um, and one of the things I've really been tuned into from following Pascal's work is this idea of how big of an effect um, infusing web and mobile design with animation can have. Um, so today, like I said, we really want to just take the first half and focus on uh, kind of taking a tour through your portfolio and seeing, you know, how do you think about getting animation into the design, um, not just from the point of view of making it pretty, but making it more of a utility. Um, but uh, yeah, everyone, please very quietly welcome Pascal da Silva. <laughs> hey, um, how does my how does my face sound? Sounds good. Does my voice look good? Um, well, what can I start with? Well, how about the latest stuff that I've been working on? Um, I do a blend of mobile and web stuff, and have throughout my career. The latest stuff I've been working on has been around Kizi, our uh, iOS instrument. If you haven't seen it before, it is. Let's see if I can make a new board. It's this thing, and you can uh, record sounds into it. Mm -hmm. Actually, this is a broken build. Let me get a better one. <laughs> Hey, hey, whoa, another broken build. Forget it. <laughs> you, can, you can see a video later. But it is a sound sampler. And we do a lot of our prototyping for it with uh, various tools. It is uh, quite an animation-driven interface. And to be able to create these prototypes, we use a combination of desktop software um, that's native, like Quartz Composer or or uh, Google Form, or even a linear animation timeline like After Effects. Um, and we also do prototypes in the browser, so using um, like Framer JS or Pixate or any of these other really great browser tools. Um, so I guess I'll go ahead and screen share. Yeah, and maybe and we, can, we can start with some of your, so maybe some of your early projects, and we can work up to, to some stuff. Do you want to go backwards and then up into, into Keezy? Up to you. What, do you. what do you think would be a good representation of using animation in some of your designs? Um, I mean, I could, I could definitely show you some, some stuff with Keezy. I got, a, I got a whole list of stuff. We well, can go start, reverse start chronologically. Yeah. yeah. So let's see. All right. Desktop one, that looks right. Start screen share. Okay. There we go. Great. Open up this folder. All right. So, let's see if I can get this guy working. So this was a prototype we built for Keezy. Uh, I built it with Jake, who is one of the co-founders and also is an engineer. And we were testing out this concept that I like to call contextual zooming. 
and that is the idea of zooming into a particular part of an interface to expose detail. And uh, I guess in the past they've called these types of things like a, a ZUI, a zoomable user interface. Right. Um, but that has a, a couple of other interesting properties to it. That is, when you zoom in and out, you get uh, different levels of, of detail. When you pop into a context, you expose um, more detail. And then when you pull out of the context, you remove as much detail as possible to abstract it. So let's see if this prototype still works. So if you long hold on one of these, these tiles, you see this, uh, this couple of options that you can um, perform on a sound. Oop, that's a little broken. This is why it's a prototype. <laughs> so that's just one example. Um, we made another one. Sorry about that, everybody. We're back on oh, my goodness. We're back. OK. Let's try that again. Screen share. All right. Let's screen share desktop one. I totally apologize for that. Um, all right. This is a uh, prototype we built for a feature we call Sticky Record. And uh, it allows you to record hands-free with the device. So I wanted to visualize what it looked like when you initiated Sticky Record. This little, like, wormy spinner would appear. So when you tap on the tile, you get this, mm. this guy spinning, and it, it springs up. And then you tap it again, and it disappears. So the reason we built this thing with, with Framer was so we could test it out on our on our devices mm -hmm. themselves. Um, and of course, like some of these ideas are things that could actually work in a browser instrument if we decided to do that. Right. Um, it's one thing designing animation in a linear timeline. And that works for, for some things. You make an After Effects composition of how the thing should look. But there are some, some prototypes where you got to really understand what it feels like to have the thing under your finger and mm -hmm. to touch the thing. And and with something like Keezy, was it animating it the idea from the beginning? Yeah. So I talk about this concept called transitional interfaces. And that is the idea that all interfaces should leverage time as a dimension. And that is, you know, we think about shape, we think about color, we think about form. And another thing that we should think about is time. And you can communicate a lot of information with time. Um, these, it, these, uh, these devices that we use, that we make software on, that we experience software with on the mobile phone, on the desktop, are all things that we interact with kinetically. That is like we're either dragging something around or we're clicking. And our bodies are actually moving and, and responding. And our, our eyes are looking all over the place. And to just hit you with instantaneous state changes is pretty abrupt. Mm -hmm. These things should move and respond in the same way that we move and respond you know, into the interfaces. Yeah. So we try to do as much prototyping as we can to communicate how the interface should move and communicate information. Um, you know, an, an example of uh, one of these non-interactive prototypes, so this is like an example of a, a timing spec mm -hmm. that it would make for an engineer. This is a, this was an older recording animation. And over here, we have like a frame count and the, the frames per second. So the engineer has an idea of the timing. And this is what it looked like previously to record a sound with, with Keezy. Uh. 
And the reason this was made was it was a, a, little, a little more complex to implement. This had to be implemented in iOS. There had to be some complex masking and, and timing. So this was just generally a reference thing for an engineer to be able to compare animation timing to. So something that's really important in designing motion is understanding timing, when things happen, when things coincide with each other, how fast, how slow, what's the timing function on these things. So we try to communicate that in as many ways as, as possible. Um, here's another prototype. Let's see if we can get this guy to work. So this was one that we we canned. It was called the Loop Maker. Mm -hmm. And people really wanted looping and keys. They were like, man, I want to loop. I want to loop. I want to like record my performances. And uh, this, this is sort of an early thing. And you'll see at the very top of the screen, there's there'll be this timeline. And what it would do is record quantized uh, timing that is like snapped to the grid of uh, when audio was triggered with Keezy. So there's this, also this little metronome animation down here, huh. right? And a record button. So if I hit record, and it should loop. Oh, nice. In some ways, yeah. So we call the little timeline thing uh, memory. Keezy Drummer is more of a uh, more of a sequencer, and I'll go over some stuff with Keezy Drummer in, in just a moment. Um, with Keezy, it's more of a live playback instrument. So we found that it was just like adding a, a lot of complexity to the complexity to the interface that we didn't feel was right at the moment, but. It helped a lot to prototype it. And, you know, again, it's one thing to, like, make wireframes and to, to, to draw notes and to make a couple of animation comps that are, that are linear, but it's another thing to be able to interact with the actual thing. Mm -hmm. And this is an example, an example that we needed to actually use. And, you know, we spent about a week on it. It was, it was really fun. Like, we were able to, like, put together some pretty cool beats and... And, uh, and it did probably, did it ever occur to you to try to make Keezy as a static design, or was it like, it's got to be animated? Never, it never. So the very first version of, of Keezy started as an experiment at Elepath. And for those of, those of you who don't know what Elepath is, uh, very early Elepath was an experimental software incubator. Um, a lot of great people were brought into the company, and they were able to generate ideas inside the company. Unlike regular incubators where you might have an idea outside and then you bring them in and then you look for mentorship, this was like your job at LPATH was to, to, to make really crazy ideas. And we were, were trialing this, uh, this new engineer. His name's Jared Luber. And we used to work together at a previous company, a, a games company. And we wanted to see how he'd work inside the LPATH environment. So we wanted to make uh, make something that we could polish in a day or two. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to build some sort of soundboard app. And he described it to me. He's like, yeah, there's like seven sound banks, and you, you can play and you can pause the sound, and you can delete them. And I was like, okay. So I went up to the whiteboard, and I was like, how about we, we try to do as little interface as possible, make it all functional, and communicate it as as broadly as possible. So I went up to the whiteboard, and I drew a box that was the size of an iPhone, and I split it up into eight. I was like, well, instead of seven, let's give them eight, because that's an octave. That's like a unit that is, that is musical. Right. And instead of having a play and a pause button, let's just make that the functions of the tiles. If there's nothing on them, there's a microphone. Mm -hmm. Uh, if there's something on it, you can play it back, back, and then we'll come up with a way to delete. But the very first version, um, you couldn't save your boards. Mm -hmm. You couldn't even delete the first time. You had to restart the app. Right. Um, but it was very kinetic from the beginning. I described it. I was like, well, these are tiles. You can push them in, and they should they should have some sort of give to them. And there was a, there was a funny moment where you know I was sitting at my desk. He was sitting at at his desk, and he's like, hey Pascal, I gotta like got to name the, the GitHub repo for this thing. What should I call it? And I was like, I don't know. How about like Keezy or Blip Blop? And he was like, 
yeah, I don't know about Blip Blop. And I was like, yeah, Keezy. And that was like the first name Maybe. that I came up <laughs> with, and it happened to, you know, stay on years years later. Um, but, yeah, anyway, cool. we've been making more instruments. Mm -hmm. And our latest instrument is sort of like a drum machine, mm -hmm. and it's called Keezy Drummer. And it utilizes this contextual zooming concept again. Um, but this time, it really focuses on um, degrading the interface as you pop in and out. So and then we can show people with the drummer. Yeah, so I'm going to bring up drummer, if I can find it. Here we go. OK, so I'm going to have to fire open the terminal. Uh... All right. Oh, did I quit it again? No, we're good. <laughs> yeah, you're good. Whew. These browsers. <laughs> All right. So let's see if I can get the first prototype of Keezy Drummer up. Uh, local. I always type local host as logcat host. Alright. So, we made this in the browser before we made it for iOS. Cool. So this is a very, very primitive prototype. I'll turn these things off and then I'll give you a, an explanation of what the hell is going on here. So at the core of the core of drummer, it's like a 16-step sequencer. Mm -hmm. And in in the live app you can control the tempo and you can um, you can delete stuff. But we really wanted to communicate how the interface moves and um, what it feels like to drill into these levels of detail. So from the outer kind of home view we have these instruments. Mm -hmm. And the different colors represent different instruments. And there's this constant ticker going on inside each one of these. So you pop into one of these, and you see that these, this white circle is triggering when one of these samples is going to be hit. So when you, when you click or when you tap on one of these things, it should register a drum hit. And then you know you can pop out, and you can see that this is being activated mm -hmm. on the inside. And what's key here to this contextual zooming is that the thumbnail isn't the little grid of 16 pieces. That's far too that's far too much information to have in this right. composition. We use motion to degrade it. We fade it out. We scale it down, and only show you what's important. Because in this view, you don't care about the individual pattern inside. You care about just what's happening to this instrument yeah. in general. Uh, Akash is curious, um, is this uh, JavaScript animation? Yep, so this this prototype was also made with Framer.js. So, you know, you can go in and put your, your toms, some claps. And this is this is inspired by hardware that has done this kind of thing. For, you know. Definitely. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the very first version we built was it was a 16 step sequencer but it was much like the hardware itself mm -hmm. uh, I'm just gonna kill this for now um, it was much like the hardware itself that is it was two rows of eight mm -hmm. which you know we did it at first because it was like oh that's a natural impulse like that's how we've seen it in other hardware but something that's so true of music hardware is that a lot of the user interfaces aren't all that intuitive yeah. or well designed. They're actually pretty poorly designed. 
And a lot of the reason these things are laid out in a particular way is like a constraint of the hardware. They're mm -hmm. like, well, the board's this long, and we want to keep the thing about this big, so that, let's not lay it out in the optimal way. Let's lay it out in a way that um, that just makes sense for the hardware. Right. So the first version, you know, you have to turn the iPhone horizontally, and I was like, eh, this is kind of weird. Well, what's a better way to think about it? What are other groups? Well, 16 makes sense. It gives you enough granularity, and it's a division of four, mm -hmm. and you know, the, the classic musical timing is 4-4. Four, four. So I was like, well, what if we just made it 4-4 four four, and then each line represented a bar? Mm -hmm. So that was even more intuitive, and then you could just have a look at how the beats lined up with each other. And that was immediately more intuitive. So the very first version of, of Drummer's, like, uh, interface, I, you know, I, I made some compositions, which... I don't know if I could dig these up right now. They're they're buried somewhere. Mm -hmm. But it was really just animation of like this grid popping up and scaling down and understanding what that contextual zoom felt like. And then I I brought it over to uh, my partner Jake and I said, Hey man, like here's my artist rendition of it. In in that process I wasn't working out how to make it functional. I was trying to be loose and and colorful and not think about implementation. I was designing like I was sketching. Mm -hmm. And then I brought it to him I'm like, hey, here's how I think it should work. Let's work on getting it functional. Right. And then he engineered it and he got this this contextual zooming thing to work. And it was immediately fun. We we're like, oh shit, we've got this like cool new instrument. Yeah. And we passed that along to our um, our iOS engineer, Mark. And he had a a working version of that in about a day, wow. which was awesome. We were <laughs> able to just play with this cool beat maker on our, on our phone. Yeah. Um, but from the very beginning, it was driven by motion. It was mm -hmm. it was driven by and interacting with that that motion. So this actually might be a good time for a, a question that we got emailed in by a few people, which is, can you talk about the process of what you just talked about, handing off something like this to the engineers? Sure. Yeah. So the process of handing things off to engineers in general, when you're working with a basis of animation, depends on the problem you're solving. There is no single workflow that makes sense, and I don't think there ever could, mm -hmm. because so much of it is problem solving. It's a new problem every time. But the key is to be able to communicate this stuff as well as possible. So, you know, like just passing a d developer, like a, a web developer, a Quartz Composer document is nice if you want to show how particular things are related to each other, but there might be a thing that you've designed in the timing that is really important. And when you're dealing with something like Quartz Composer, you're thinking about the implementation. How are these views nested inside of each other? You don't have amazing animation timing control. Mm -hmm. But if you're using like a linear timeline, you could you you know you could deliver two prototypes and you could say, well, this is how it should work. This is how the views should should move when you when you kind of click on them. But this linear animation timeline really has the proper timing function in there. You try to deliver as much stuff as possible. So you know in the things that I've delivered for Keezy, and we, we've done like web implementations of some of these instruments as mm -hmm. well. They've involved After Effects compositions, Quartz Composer um, documents, uh, Google Form, which is confusing because there's so many products called Form, but this company called Relative Wave, which recently got acquired by, by Google, made this thing that's kind of similar to Quartz Composer, as in it's a, a signal box like flow programming environment, mm -hmm. which I'll pop into later. Um, do that, um, do some stuff with Framer, and uh, sometimes just like a video, like miming the thing out right. is enough, because sometimes it's too complex a thing to be able to put down in pixels mm -hmm. anything that you can do to capture the spirit. And of course, if you are able to pass over numbers and values and... Um, and, and layout to an engineer, that's even better because right. that's less front-end work that they have to do. We've been finding that a lot of the work we've been doing at Keezy 
um, in engineering has been like front end development for web. There's a lot of work we do to just get layout and animation to be good. Right. And then, of course, there's the more deep end, like back end data stuff that has to happen. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, we're working on our own tools um, at Keezy to be able to make some of that stuff easier for designers so we can do more of this front end stuff on mobile. Mm. Um, you know, and some interesting things we've been peeping at lately is Facebook's like React. Mm -hmm. um, they've been doing a lot of interesting things with the box model. Um, and especially as we see these mobile devices, I mean, Apple fragmented the hell out of them once they released these other bigger phones. Yeah. The devices, it's like designing. It's like designing for the web again. You're like designing relative layout, mm -hmm. and we've already done a pretty good job on the web of using the box model um, and manipulating the box model. Even though some parts are a little, a little messy, that mentality can still apply to the way that we do stuff on on iOS or on, mm -hmm. on Android or whatever mobile software we're using. Cool. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get back to some more questions in a bit when we keep uh, getting, a little, getting a little tour. Yeah, so let's see what else I got in my bag of tricks. Um, oh, this one was fun. So back in the Elipath days, we had this really crazy um, project, and it was the first thing that I brought in the Elipath. It was called Debris. And I'll tell you, this was before Snapchat existed. It was a thing where you could post images and they would get destroyed, but like in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And the craziest stuff was on there. I think like, like uh, not as insane as like 4chan, but like really crazy stuff, like discussions happening in real time. Mm. And there were pictures, there were videos. Uh, you could snap a picture in with your webcam. So it was like a visual IRC. It was, it was publicly released? Yeah, it was publicly released, and we killed the thing. Um, but eventually we like... We, we stacked it on top of IRC, and it it, uh, it powered the thing. Right. It, was, it was called Debris, and it was a very fun thing. It was the first project I brought into Elipath as an experiment. I worked on a lot of experiments at Elipath, probably between 30 to 40 wow. different products. And some of them lasted like three months, like two weeks, an hour. There was a thing called Pick Duck. I don't even remember what the thing was. The logo was like a duck with a camera. Anyway, Debris was really cool. And it was an animation-driven web interface. So let's see if I have any comps of this thing. Oh, my goodness. This stuff is so old. You could upload, like, a picture from your webcam. Mm -hmm. You could drop a link. You could toss something into the browser. And, you know, like, the static composition doesn't really give you a good idea of how the thing should work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you could upload stuff and crop your avatar. Oh, cool. There was this, <laughs> it was crazy. There was this, like, he's kind of an asshole. He was this uh, mascot um, who would be on, on the top and give you instructions, and you would, like, pop him out with a speech bubble, and you'd be like... like the Microsoft Word paper clip. Yeah, he was our Clippy, mm -hmm. and uh, he, was, he was Saturn, and he would say, uh, you know, you'd use slash commands. So there was this, uh, oh, it was so mean, but such a funny first-time experience for people. that go to the site... I think uh, M.G. Siegler might have, like, put out a tweet about this thing. He's, like, a um, tech blogger. Mm -hmm. And, like, you know, we saw, like, a thousand people spill into the into the room. We wanted to load test the thing. <laughs> and, um, we had this naming convention for new people that came into the room, and it was curse word animal. <laughs> so you can imagine all the permutations that came up. So people would, like, type in stuff and be like, why is my name, like, Dick Dingo? And... And then, you know, as soon as you type something in, Saturn would be like, hey, type in slash Nick loser to change your name. And then people would change their name to loser accidentally. <laughs> yeah, troll. It was like, it was crazy, but then I think people realized that it was just like goofing around and they had fun. The software is making fun of you. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> so when you put stuff into the room, it like actually animated its, its way in. Huh. So let's see if I have any, any animation of this. Um, whoa. Wow. Nope, that was for something else. Here we go. So you drag something into this thing, and the content would slide down. You have to forgive the fact that there's proxies here. So this, this was actually for when you snap the picture with your webcam. You'd hit the button, 
and then the whole stream would slide down because it, it was indicating that you would be injecting something into the stream. And this thing here represented your webcam. So the prototype I built actually would show you your live webcam feed. And then this little button would come out from underneath it. And you hit the snap button, and then it would count down. And you're like, three, two, one. Mm -hmm. And it would capture it. And then it would slide back up. And then you would see the image inject itself into the stream, because cool. that image was already there. So mm -hmm. it was like this persistent thing. Um, that, was, that was a very crazy project. Um, another thing was a, uh, a desktop uh, file sharing tool called Wormhole. Hmm. And the idea was that you could send files to other people in, in, in your team. And this is long before like all the great stuff that exists now, like Slack and, and HipChat were around. So I wanted to build this thing that was like this HUD, and it would slide down. And you could drag something onto the HUD, and it would upload. Mm -hmm. And then when it was finished uploading, the HUD would slide up, and then someone would just like, they'd get like a notification that the file had been sent. Nice. So the browser or a Mac app? Um, it was a Mac app. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to create the artist's impression of what it felt like um, because at Early Ellipath, we had to convince engineers to work on projects. Designers yeah, and engineers cool. had to convince each other because everyone was just, it, it was a flat hierarchy. You need a first follower. Yeah, so you have to have a designer and an engineer on your, on your project. So I made this thing that would be compelling enough for an engineer to be like, oh, fuck yeah, I want to build this thing. Mm -hmm. So... You know, here's a little demo. You drag the oh, actually, here's a little demo. Let's see if this works. Quick time, more like slow time. So you drag the file to the top, and this oh, cool. HUD would drop down. You could drop it to a group or individual people. So if you sent it to a group, it would, it would burst to everyone. It was a little spinning worm guy. That animation is awesome. And, yeah, this was, like, generally to, like, communicate what that, what that flow feels like, what it felt like kinetically to get that, that information across. Is this the same type of tools you, you talked about for, like, Easy Drummer? And this is exactly the same types of, types of tools mm -hmm. to design the stuff. Um, this was this was just After Effects, and eventually I went on to make some like Quartz Composer things, so you could actually feel what it was like to drag something to the visor mm -hmm. and have a look at how reactive the thing would be and look yeah. at the general timing for it. So, all right. So the first two things we looked at were the plan was mobile from the beginning. Obviously, the plan here is desktop. Mm -hmm. So how how do you think about animation differently there? Because with mobile, you talked about it's got to be almost part of your body, like you're, yeah. you're feeling it. But obviously, that's not the case here. So what do you yeah. have to do to infuse that here? I would I would argue that on the desktop, it's still pretty kinetic because mm -hmm. you're moving you're moving this guy around, yeah. right? You're, pad. you're putting your elbow into it, and you're getting. RSI, or carpal tunnel syndrome. It's coming from something. Mm -hmm. So that should that should be reflected in the in the interface. Um, of course, not to the point where everything's just like bouncing around and like it, it's too much information for your your eyes to handle. But I think like any of those points where you're you're making a significant motion or you're 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 transferring transferring information, it makes sense to communicate that state change. Mm -hmm. So for this, um, for, for, for Wormhole, uh, the, the interaction was dragging something to the top of the visor, and that requires like, quite, a, quite a bit of force. Right. So how do, you, how do you communicate that? You communicate it in the way that the visor slides down. You communicate it with maybe when you're tossing the file and there's... Um, there's some momentum or inertia, so the thing like keeps moving. Um, if you move up and down really fast, it should like respond in that in that mm -hmm. same way. You should expect these things to respond in you know an an equal uh, with an equal amount of respect that you put in as is, far as motion goes. Is time still a dimension here? Like if I drag it really fast, does it come down faster? Yeah, yeah, and you know the the way you first start blocking this stuff out isn't designing the simulation being like, well, it should be 0.3 times the speed of how fast they drag up. Mm -hmm. The first thing is like you just design the ideal, and you don't design it with a physics simulation. You design 
how, like, what it should look like, what it feels right, and then from there you kind of break it down. So maybe you design a version for when you're dragging the file up there really slow. And then you're like, okay, well, I can see the two points. How do we interpolate it? What would be a good, like, mathematical fit? And that's when you then hop into, like, right. engineering the curves or, or the physics behind the thing. Right. But those but, aren't in the MVP necessarily. No, they, they, they shouldn't be because then you spend way too much time tuning a simulation instead of designing timing. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine if you worked that way with other things, with right. like layout, and you're like, I'm just going to toss a box here and like do this and do this and, until it feels right. Like you, you, you make informed decisions about how these these things work. Cool. Um, oh, Neat mentions he has carpal tunnel and it sucks. Oh so, no! Sorry to hear that. Um, what else do I have? I have. Uh, huh. This was a uh, a fun project. So this one was called Handoff, and this was this was all in the browser. And Handoff, um, let's see, Handoff was a thing that would allow you to auto annotate your PSDs or sketch files. So instead of designers having the spec, it, it's kind of like the engineer having the equivalent of. Uh, WebKit inspector or Chrome inspector, where you can like mouse over different parts of the PSD. Right. So there, are, you know, uh, it was it was uh, Layer Vault that released a, a library that allowed you to um, to pull the guts out of the, the PSD and and look at stuff. And you're like, oh shit. Well, we're already doing a lot of this stuff, and it, like we're such a small team, it doesn't make sense to be redlining. I mean, you shouldn't really have to redline any of that stuff. Like the information is in the document. Mm -hmm. Why can't you just look at the document? Well. It's kind of crappy for an engineer to have to hop into Photoshop and, and measure and like break their workflow. They only care about like the measurements and the, and the sizing. So we're able to pull that stuff out of the out of the PSD, and um, you know, so you'd like mouse over the different parts of the document, and it would it would be like an inspector. Cool. And the stuff I the stuff I did here, there was like more fun like marketing interaction stuff. Uh, it was called handoff and uh, one kind of silly prototype I built. Um, let's see. Can that last one be like an extension or uh, or a plugin to Photoshop? Um, there are plugins that exist right now, but the thing is, it requires you having to have a license of Photoshop, and we wanted people to be able to access the information in their PSDs anywhere and right. just like do it in in the browser. Um, so. I made this thing when you're dropping your uh, your your PSD into the browser window. I wanted this hand to like try to catch it. I built that in a. That was just in Quartz Composer. Just a, an arm asset that has uh, springs on it. Oh, we're getting a little feedback. Yeah. Oh, I think someone's channel is muted. Um. And yeah, so there was like. I had I had like the timing idea in my head and I was like, well I could build this thing and then like pass it to our engineer Jacob who was who was working on the uploader. So that was kind of fun. Um, that's more of a case of like design personality coming in over over functionality. Mm -hmm. I mean th this one here was uh, more functionality. You'd have like a stack of let's say revisions or a group and you wanted to expose what's inside it. So I made this thing that would pop open the um, the thumbnails and it'd spread them, spread them open like cards. So I built this thing and uh, also in Quartz Composer. That's great. And of course, like you can then kind of look at the the logic of this stuff. It's a lot of boxes and noodles, but um, you can see how everything's connected to each other as far as logic goes in this in this document. Mm -hmm. So it's just a bunch of sprites wired up to a like a hover hmm. animation, and that's that hit area is on this this little purpley lavender guy. Mm -hmm. right? So a lot of a lot of this stuff starts as internal tools, it sounds like, and then you know if you see possibility, you, you make we're it public. we're big we're big on doing that stuff internally. Um, I was mentioning this to you before, but a guiding principle at LPath is one that we call the muser, mm -hmm. and I'll send you a link to the, the very first article about a muser, and that's a term that our uh, our founder Jake uh, coined. 
and that is like your user, that is your software's muse. Mm -hmm. It's not for a, a focus group, but it's for a real person. It's like Tony the plumber who mm -hmm. like needs something to like measure a pipe or something like that. Or I needed something to be able to help me store all the, all the color palettes that I make. Right. And you can then solve very specific problems instead of like, man, I wonder what that million dollar idea would be right. that 100,000 people want. Like, you end up making something that's, that's watered down if you're, if you're thinking that way. Right. If you can make something great for one person, then it's really easy to make it to the second person and the third and the fourth. And then when you have the input of four people that are already very well satisfied, um, then, you know, you can, you can scale to more people. Yeah. Awesome. Um, well, maybe we'll start migrating towards some Q&A. Yeah, let's um, do that. Yeah, so uh, you know, everybody uh, who's tuned in, feel free to hop any questions into the chat for Pascal. And Should I hit the one. stop screen? Yeah, why don't you go back to video? Yeah, so let's, let's do that. Yeah, so we're back on video. Hello, everybody. Um, so I have to get us started. I have some questions that were emailed in. But uh, like I said, everyone, um, please feel free to send us some more now. So, um, so we we talked about this a little bit, but um, this is almost like a like a question a songwriter might get about what comes first, music or lyrics. Sure. You know, but you know, how do you find do you find yourself creating animations just for fun, for the joy, for the art, and then see possibility for design utility, or do you always think I have a practical need right now? You kind of just mentioned that, um, and then come up with a design for it, or, or both. Yeah. Big time. Um, I think that those aren't quite opposites, as in creating an experimental thing can be done to like satisfy yourself. Mm -hmm. So I come from a background in, I mean, my, my earliest work was not in software. It was in, in, in film and TV animation and making things that were entertaining. And there are a lot of things that are just like entertaining to me mm -hmm. that I would, I, would, I would make for fun. Um, like, recently, uh, I put out a, a video called Chromo, and uh, Chromo, no Chromo, bro, uh, Cr Chromo was a video that I made to visualize my color synesthesia. Mm. Synesthesia is, for those that don't know, is like a cross-wiring of senses. Mm. So for me, I have this, I thought it was a normal thing, but I have this thing where if I hear colors or if I see a name, sorry, if I, <laughs> if I, if I hear color, if I hear sounds, yeah. If I see faces or hear names, I'll see color. And sometimes it's literally just, like, fired out of my retina. I'm like, oh, shit. Like, this, I guess this is unusual. After talking to friends, they're like, dude, yeah, you're, you're kind of crazy. And I thought it'd be fun to, like, visualize it. So I made a video based on some music that I composed for fun. Because I'm, like, you know, learning the, to, to play with, like, Ableton and, and, and discovering new techniques. I was like, well, this would be more fun if I visualized it using the same like pictures that were in my head when I was composing music. And so I just made this little short film. It was like a minute. And then I put it out. And in, in doing that, I was, I was like then thinking about other ways that this could be great for other people. And I thought, like, you know, with, with, with Keezy, we're a music company. Mm -hmm. And we're very visual and animation driven. And a lot of the cues come from my like color synesthetic brain. Wouldn't it be cool if other people could make great videos mm -hmm. or manipulate music with, with color and, and picture? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of overlap there. I thought, like, hey, what if you had the source files to make music, like the individual stems and tracks? Then you could make a cool visualizer, not one that's with the flattened down tracks, but all the individual instruments. You could visualize the drum hits. Mm -hmm. You could visualize the harmonies. You could even do it the other way around and let someone manipulate a triangle or a square or or something else and, mm -hmm. and, and jiggle it around and have it generate music. So it kind of like it kind of works both both ways. You can create concepts and they will inspire other things. Or you'll yeah. see a problem and you're like, hey, well maybe you can solve it with like thought about about motion. I mean it's just general design thinking. Sure. In cool. That case. All right, so um I apologize if I mispronounced the name. Uh, Shetan uh, just uh, chatted in some technical questions. Could you share some resource to learn courts and form? Uh, yeah. Uh, let me think. Well, there's not really a huge number of 
Quartz Composer uh, resources that are relative to interaction designers at the moment. And this is because the, the biggest part of the Quartz Composer scene, and I'll, I'll, group, I'll group Google Form into it, even though they deserve their own category, but for the, for the context of this, Quartz Composer is used by uh, a lot of what they call VJs, video jockeys, that would make like the, the trippy, psychedelic, drug-inspired visuals that would be triggered by music. Mm -hmm. um, so as a result, they're not particularly inter they weren't particularly interactive. There's a lot of tutorials out there that are like how to make stuff with feedback loops and stuff. Mm -hmm. But there are a couple of videos. I I'm trying to remember the fella's name. One other there are two people. I forget the second one, but the first one, he interned at at Elopath for about three weeks, and his name is Dave O'Brien. He works at Twitter now, and he put out a couple of videos on recreating Facebook Home. So you know those goofy chat heads. Mm -hmm. He like made a thing that would. It was like a three-part video talking about how he built that in Quartz Composer, and this was even before. Um, Origami existed, which is a little library that Facebook made that um, has a bunch of patches, which are really great, and uh, also some improvements to Quartz Composer. Um, same kind of thing goes for, for Google Form. Um, they do have their own communities and like Facebook groups where you can, where you can learn a bunch. Um, but I, I really would love to see some more fundamental uh, resources out there. Maybe that's something that I could work on in my own time. But uh, you just sort of hacked around with it to to learn it on your own. A lot, a lot of it is like hacking around. the The thing is like this: Quartz Composer and Form are are old paradigms, and these have existed like long before we've seen these tools made for for the Mac desktop. Um, the signal flow stuff has been most prominent in 3D software. And uh, it, it was really familiar to me because I spent my a lot of my early days in um, in Autodesk Maya, which has a like node graph kind of thing where you can where you can rig stuff. So say like you're animating a character and when it twists its arm, you want like a muscle to flex. Mm. You can like wire things up to each other and you can say when the rotation is at 30 degrees, make this uh, scale 20%. Mm -hmm. And when you're thinking in those ways, it's, it's, it's pretty easy. Um, I'd say the best way to learn Quartz Composer or Form or any of these signal processing apps is to just come up with some very, very simple interactions or find something in one of your own projects to apply it to. And it could be as simple as like making a hover state for something, mm -hmm. or like a toggle. Um, even though you might know how to do these things with like some simple JavaScript, learning how to recreate that stuff in this in this signal processing environment will like open your mind to understand how to do the other other pieces. Mm. Um, it, it's funny um, we actually made our own in browser signal processing thing before the, the Quartz Composer thing blew up, mm. and we killed it. It was called Moonbase, and it was supposed to be an easier version of the thing. Um, guys are ahead on like every little trend. Yeah, but we kill them. We kill them because we're like, it's either going to be way too much work, or the target audience is a little too small, mm. or you, we would just need a, a gigantic team. Um, we killed a lot of things. <laughs> a lot of people killed a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> All right, um, next question. Um, so this one, actually, a few people emailed in. You, you were kind of just hinting at it, but if you were talking to people that have spent years just doing static stuff, haven't touched animation, but want to do their first thing related to it, what what translates well from a lot of a lot of work under your belt in, in the static design world to like jumping into your first animated project? Um, my advice would be to learn that stuff for even a month away from the computer. Hmm. The, uh, the best book and a lot of a lot of classical and 3D animators consider this to be like the animator's bible, is the animator's survival kit, written by uh, Richard Williams. Cool. And uh, he was the animation director of Who Framed Roger Rabbit. He was trained by brilliant animation greats. And there's a lot 
of very interesting formulas and theory about animation timing. I think it's crucial that you understand From anim drawn animation. Time. Drawn yeah. animation. That's how I started. Hmm. I think it's very important that you understand timing and animation theory before hopping into these tools because if you spend time in the tools and you're worrying about implementation, mm. you become blind to muddy animation, you become lazy, and you don't know how to see motion. Mm -hmm. um, it's like in the same way if you're learning, if you know about like learning to draw, learn to draw from life and then learn to see. Mm -hmm. it's the same thing with um, understanding motion. But, you know, after you've spent your time um, after you spend your time reading, start doing things that are, again, like non-software related. Uh, try traditionally animating a ball. G grab a copy of Flash. Like, it's, it's kind of a piece of crap right now, but it's still okay for animation. Put a ball onto the screen, a circle on the screen, and get it to move from left to right with mm -hmm. good animation timing. Make a thing spin around. Make a, a, a ball bounce. Like, understand how to do that and then move over to software. Mm -hmm. Start playing with After Effects, then start worrying about mm -hmm. Quartz Composer and all of these other things. The, the thing with, it, with, with these, these other packages is that you run into having to run two mindsets at once. It's um, good animation timing, I mean, if you want to design well, and then implementation at the same time. You're juggling both those things. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the fundamentals down, you end up just making crap. So in, as opposed to kind of modern engineering learning, it sounds like it's really a skill you want to you wanna catch up on the history of it to get to where we are. Big time. We've been doing it for years longer than we've been doing computing. Right. Um, I, I started hosting uh, little classes with our, uh, our Kizi employees, including engineers, and making videos to explain a lot of classical animation principles. And that helps um, our engineering team understand how to build stuff uh, to work well with animation as a core part of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it changes like the, the structure and foundation of how a lot of stuff is structured inside the app. Right. Very cool. Um, next question. Um, so sort of in the broader landscape right now, what design patterns are you seeing emerge from the products that are really well received? From the products that are really well received? That's a good question. Um, I'm seeing... I would say that some of the best work I've seen have come from They've come from like a lot of individuals that have been leading these these projects that have motion backgrounds. A lot of stuff I, I would say is coming from people with animation and games backgrounds. And I think we have a lot of stuff to to learn from games. Um, I think that understanding animation in the context of interactivity is something that people have got right in games for years understanding how to make animation that can be like interrupted mm -hmm. um, is a hard thing to wrap your head around. Uh, you know, I, I haven't seen a huge amount of really well-designed animation yeah. projects so far. Um, Do you feel like it's still kind of underground? Like, are we going to see, like, Twitter or Facebook use animation more? Twitter, Twitter's think? getting a little better. Yeah. Uh, I've definitely torn him a, a new asshole a couple of times uh, in in talks, uh, but they have been getting better. There's some I think there's some stuff they're still like working out how to balance. Like, well, man, like you should chill out on that animation of like when you start up Twitter and the freaking bird shoots out and it feels mm -hmm. like it's gonna punch you in the face, or you hit the favorite button and then it's just like 80 frames of like, oh, yeah, like that's that's like. Cool, and they probably spent like a bunch of weeks on that thing. But it, it's very strange that animation timing thought or design has gone into that right. um, instead of other places that could use it more. But um, oh, like the stuff for for Twitter uh, Twitter video that um, his name his Twitter name Stammy did a lot of stuff with um, 
with uh, with Framer, and a lot of it was like interactive, well designed animation. Like mm-hmm. that was really cool. It's funny that it's so it's so buried, but like I thought that was a really good piece of uh, interface interaction work. Mm-hmm. So I mean, following some of those patterns, uh, whether the individuals doing the the cool stuff. I mean, in in five years, what are we going to be talking about in terms of animation on mobile and web? It's a good question. Um, I think that we'll inevitably have better tools. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that I think that a lot of interfaces are going to feel more like simulations, mm-hmm. and you're going to have to think about motion, otherwise you're going to be left behind. There's so much information you can communicate. Virtual reality too. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, huge on uh like all these VR startups mm-hmm. coming into place. Um, I've been spending a lot of time with like um, with the Oculus and like messing around and trying to build like prototypes for interfaces with the thing. I'm not convinced that that is going to be the thing that catches on, but mm-hmm. we're seeing glimpses into the into the future. Um, we're going to see new types of hardware. Like I've been uh, hanging out with this cool volumetric display company, um, and it's been really exciting thinking about like what does an interface look like for that? Well, of course, mm-hmm. like it's going to be animated. Mm-hmm. Like we're, we're seeing more pieces of hardware, like the Nest. We're, we're seeing, like, interfaces happen in cars. We're going to have mm. all these other devices that, like, like surpass the stuff that we're doing on desktop and, and mobile. So we better get, like, really fucking good with this stuff because right. all this other stuff is, is coming, and it's not going to be built on the same static foundation that we've mm. been stuck with for years. It's going to be something completely new. Gotcha. Um, so another kind of technical question um, is there a way to auto layout in courts or form that you know of the, um, this guy's mentioning as soon as he has multiple screens, it starts getting messy. And oh, complex. that is the bane of my existence. <laughs> a lot of these things suck at uh, state layout. And something that I think Quartz Composer and Form is sorely missing is the concept of a state machine. Uh, I believe I saw a couple of libraries where you could toss a PSD into it and it would lay it out, but it's all based off like top left coordinates instead of like views and, and, and sub views. The layout stuff is such a pain. Um, it's it's something that um, that we're working on really hard here at, at Kesey. We just like started opening that can of can of worms. Um, I totally feel you. There's nothing good for that right now. It's 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 rough. But it'll hopefully get better. Maybe we don't get too many more screens. It'll, it'll get better. <laughs> Yeah, just try no screens. Um, with Form, it's easy to preview the output in an iOS device using Perform. Is there something similar for Quartz? Mm-hmm. No, though uh, for a while it was rumored, well confirmed, that inside Facebook they had their own their own thing, but they haven't released it. I think they ended up like snagging a lot of interesting IP when they acquired Mike Mattis mm. from Apple. He was doing a lot of the Quartz Composer prototyping stuff over there. He was like kind of the, the guy that, that led this stuff. And I think they, along with him, like got a lot of really interesting secrets. I know they've been working on that stuff over there, and I've been grilling him for a while to get that stuff out. I don't know. I don't know if it's like even on their on their radar to consider getting that stuff out, which is a bummer. Because uh, I think Quartz Composer is is Definitely more powerful. The nice thing about Form, I think that the main thing Form has going for it is the fact that you can mirror it to a device. Mm. But it's still pretty, still pretty, uh, still pretty rough. Gotcha. Cool. Well, um, probably probably the last question before we wrap up. Um, this is something a lot of uh, people in the code mentor community who are probably more biased towards engineering. Uh, think about, but you know, how much coding knowledge do you feel you you need to be su- successful in animation and and designing these apps? Um, do they feel very separate, or do you have to feel like you have to be pretty in the know with some of what the engineering guys can do? Um, I feel like as our tools get better, less and less. It certainly helps to have an understanding of engineering like principles to be able to communicate with engineers, because mm-hmm. you can't just like give them a comp and be like, here you go, man, just mm-hmm. like build it. you got to be able to, to talk to them. They're going to ask you questions. It has to be this like tight feedback loop. And that could mean like just spending some time like going through some some like lessons from many of the free resources online and like learn to write 
like some functional programming language or like um, just anything to like get your mind thinking in a way where you can swap over to an engineering mm -hmm. mentality. I mean, I don't I don't do that much engineering work at at Keezy. Mm -hmm. Like, if if it's anything, it's like um, messing with like a framer prototype. Or the engineering is like inside like some weird other software. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, to, to understand how to use a, a signal processing thing, it helps to have some understanding of, of engineering principles like switches and like conditionals mm -hmm. and, and whatnot. Or if you're making something in 3D to understand how to send all that data around, there's like engineering to it, but you're not necessarily writing like symbolic code. Right. You're like connecting boxes up to each other. Gotcha. But in your background, do, did you ever just make websites on your own? And I did. Yeah. And I, I did a lot of front-end stuff. I mean, I, I had that animation background. I also had a stint where I did a lot of, like, just web. And it wasn't, it wasn't like, back-end stuff. It was, like, hooking in some back-end stuff to front-end templates. Okay. But, you know, like, understanding how the DOM works mm -hmm. and, like, being able to style a document, of course, that stuff's really important. you got to understand the medium that you're designing for. Cool. Um, well, it's uh, it's been about an hour, so we have to wrap up, but thank you guys so much for tuning in. This will be on the Code Mentor YouTube channel uh, as soon as we end this here, and uh, we'll also write up a bunch of stuff on CodeMentor.io. Um, where's a good place for people to find and follow? Sorry, I'm just experiencing my new Oculus Rift. Right, that's um, that good. A good place to find me? Yeah, just to, to follow what you're working on and everything. Sure. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, uh, at PASQL, and on Tumblr, psql.tumblr.com. I post a lot of strange experiments there. And, oh, I also have a uh, design podcast with two other, two other buddies called The Design Dudes, and that's on um, SoundCloud and iTunes. Cool. Um, well, yeah, and, and if, if any of the designers listening in have any other questions, uh, Code Mentor does have a lot of great designers. You can always check in with us to, to get some help on anything you're working on. Um, but with that, uh, I think I'll say good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever in the world you are, and uh, thanks for tuning in today.